Welcome to an Applied Energistics 2 tutorial video, as I understand things. Right now I'm playing Minecraft 1.12.2, it's pretty old, and it's the Enigmatica 2 Expert mod pack. And I thought there's some few basic um, setups for AE2 that I always do, that some people, if they're new to the mod, they might find helpful. And this is not going to be a comprehensive tutorial, so the assumption here is you've got a vague idea how to use things. So for starters, I just wanted to show an ad hoc network. I got a creative power cell down here. I throw down the energy acceptor, which converts the energy from RF to whatever AE2 uses. And if I slap down a drive and a cable crafting terminal and these, grab some items, throw some drives in. This is like the smallest setup you can make. It's just basically you can see the drives are on. I can throw some resources in here. And everybody's happy. You can go and, you know, easily craft stuff. And this is really good for starting out, especially in a mod pack like this where controllers are expensive. The only limitation here is with channels, you're only allowed eight devices on an ad hoc network if you don't have a controller. So that means if I was to throw, I got five devices on here right now, a terminal screen plus four drives. If I was to throw on just enough drives, we'll see that it dies. The whole system actually goes offline. And as long as we've got eight devices, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, everybody's happy. Is if you use smart cables, it's pretty good at just telling you, hey, you're using five of eight. One, two, three, four, five. Throw one more down, six. Now we're using six. This is a very common early game setup for me using this ad hoc network. So again, I'm only using five channels and I've got storage buses on these crates because early game, I'll have these crates full of resources. And what you can do here is you can actually say, you know, bump the priority to 100. I might make this one, you know, 110 just to keep, hey, my crates will be in the hundreds. Um, my most, um, important storage priority wise is always going to be my controller early game and it's always helpful to build a really big storage array of um, storage drawers i think the max is 25 but don't quote me on that but if you lock the controller you'll see these locks show up and all that's locked so now even though the highest priority i guess i should do this first if i throw a if I take the stone out and put the stone back in, instead of going to this drive, it's actually going to say, hey, the highest priority of a thousand is here. Put the stone here. But if I lock it, which is highly recommended, all those are locked. So now even though the highest priority is there, it actually can go there. It's probably going to go here, of course. And what's really helpful is things like redstone. You can slap in there. And you'll actually see that this thing can see those seven blocks because it's looking at everything in here. And I will warn you though, using compact drawers with auto crafting can sometimes cause issues because it'll think, hey, you've got this much blocks of redstone plus this many um, redstone dusts. But actually, if I take these seven out, you actually lose most of those redstones. So the system thinks you've got this plus this, but when you take out one, you lose the other. So just be aware of that. That's my mob farm. I could say, hey, you know what? Every bone I get go into here. So the system is always going to try to put bones in there. And if it fills up, it'll just delete them. That way, especially early game, you don't fill up drives or these crates that have limited capacity. Another option is partitioning stuff. You can say, click on the storage bus and say, I only want you to accept cables. I would never do that. It's way too much fine, fine configurating, but it's an option. And of course there's options down here where you can set it to just take items out of here or just put items in. But for the most part, unless it's a special use application, I have it on bi-directional. I don't configure stuff too much. Priorities are kind of the biggest thing for this setup. I'm talking the ad hoc setup. The next thing would be controllers. Once your ad hoc network is too small and it fills it fast with only eight devices, you'll want a controller. 
and specifically an Enigmatic 2 expert, a lot of this stuff costs a fair sum of money. That's just for the machine chassis. Then the energy acceptor, again, is its own little rabbit hole. So starting off with the controller, I've got one thrown up there. I like to throw the quartz fiber down. Basically what this item does is it only allows energy to pass through it, not data. The rest of these cables from AE2 allow data and energy to go through them. So let's say, for instance, I had machines coming off this direction. I guess I could even show it. If I slap down two terminals and we just say throw down a dense cable, the drive there, throw in an energy cell. If I was to throw this controller in here, we'll see that there's a controller there. But of course, this guy can't see anything because this is isolating these two networks. So you could essentially have an ad hoc network going off here, a subnet. That's getting kind of complicated. If for some reason I was like, hey, I actually wanted these tied together. Once we do that, we get rid of the isolator. Of course, we can see the original item. So this FYI, when you see these white cables, they are uh, specifically the quartz fiber. There's a difference between the quartz fiber and a white cable. This is an isolator. So after that tangent, you'll notice right here, this is kind of a waste, putting a channel into a face that can take eight. So sometimes I'll do something like this. And if you're really struggling for channels, I've got 32 coming this way, 32 that way. If I really wanted 32 this way and I didn't want these to link up together, of course you can throw down the anchor, which just keeps things kind of neater. And it avoids them snapping together like that if you throw down an anchor and you could bridge up this way or whatever. And then it would allow you, you know, to throw down all your drives. I'll throw three there. I will see that three are being used. Of course, zero are being used down there. Next, I'm going to show something that's kind of advanced, but it's really powerful early game, our P2P tunnels. So if I slap down a P2P tunnel there on that face, it's what it's going to do is it's actually going to allow me to take 32 channels and basically compress them, like zip them into, into this. So potentially, you, you take 32 channels, put it into this, it's zipped into one channel. So this cable that can only hold eight channels actually holds 32 only using one channel, if that makes sense. And if it doesn't, I will sh explain it in a moment. So that's just a basic setup. Right now we'll see that the, the device is offline and I should grab this. So for a quick demonstration, we're using one channel and it's actually kind of misleading because everything's offline. Is this drive still holding something? No, it's not. Let's grab some granite, slap it in there. Okay, so that drive's now holding something. We slap that drive in here. Of course, nothing's powered. We're not going to see anything because that's offline. So we shift right click this and click here. What we've actually got is now they're programmed. You'll see the colors on there actually match these colors, but it's still offline because there's no power. The power does not propagate through the ME tunnel, only the data does. So it's a real hacky way that I don't recommend doing. You could do something like do that, throw this in here. So what this is doing is it's allowing power to come on this side of the cable. And then it basically puts power downstream and now we can see a green light there. And that's very important because I don't believe you know what, in this case, this will work, but it's bad practice because you're linking stuff together in kind of a weird way. It's best to always isolate these. And another option too, instead of wasting all these spaces, is if a guy does something like this and then that, and imagine this is going a really long way. So these cables are cheaper than running these. That's the benefit of using P2P tunnels is let's say I was actually to put this thing, you know, many chunks over, this cost is cheaper than running actually a cable of this size. So if we do this, that, and now I don't interfere with this face, just an option. And we'll see that this is unlinked because I have to 
get a new card, slap it down, and now it's linked. That turns green, and we are back in business. And another option people will do, to pick this up, is they might actually run a cable like this across their base really far away, even though I just said it's more expensive. But instead of only being able to carry eight channels that are compressed, you could actually potentially, depending on your controller layout, have 32 channels that are compressed. So 32 times 32 instead of just eight times 32. I think I'm going to save this part for the second video, but I'll try to do a quick summary here. I'll show how to build this larger controller. I'm building it currently in my survival world for this pack. There's a lot of faces that aren't being utilized, but I think it's kind of slick. And my plan when I actually build this in my survival world is to have this system, the setup here replicated on all four sides, plus the top, which would be five sides. The, um, the bottom side here, I usually, just because of the power coming in, it's a little different. I don't usually build downwards. So what I've done here is, like I said, these cables only hold eight channels. So eight P2P tunnels, this blue one is maxed out with eight and it gets fed into here. So you can see eight of 32 channels. And there's four on the red, four P2P tunnels here and four P2P tunnels here. So they also go in and that would be 16 coming in this face. And then the same setup up top, 16 coming in that face. You'll see right now, this is not powered because I wanted to show how this is the main net and this is basically a subnet. So that'd be the same thing for all sides. You'd have a subnet going this way, a subnet going that way. That's how I plan to lay out my base. And um, of course these exposed spaces are kind of a waste, but I'm not too worried. If you throw a quartz down, if you don't throw a quartz down, this happens. You can't tie a subnet to a main net, it crashes. So it's really important to isolate with the quartz fiber. And then I threw down a black cable just so it doesn't link to this cable or link to that cable, just uh, keeping things neat. So now we're powered. What I've done here is I've programmed one P2P tunnel. And then if I take this cable, I have a cable come off, I throw a P2P tunnel, I program it. And if we do this, actually, maybe if I throw four of them down, it'll demonstrate it. So you can see right now through this smart cable here, we're actually using four of 32 channels. One, two, three, four. This one shows two because it's only counting the end pieces. So we've got four channels being used. They get packed into this P2P tunnel. So they're zipped essentially. And then they're pushed into this main line and it's, it's only using one channel. So we've basically taken 32 that could be here, packed it into here. So only one's being used. It goes back through here. You can see we're using 16 on this side. 16 on this side. So the reason I set it up like this is 16 come in the top, 16 come in the bottom, and then 32 total go out. That's pretty powerful. That's 32 times 32 faces just going west. And I could do the same in the four or five other directions if I wanted to. But the next video, we'll get more into detail and um, show how I built this. And again, not efficient, but I think it's cool.